So this is one of the reasons why I'm super excited about Optimism, because they are committed to public goods, and public goods get me all hot and bothered. Good morning, Bankless Nation. It is the second week of January. David, what time is it? Oh, Ryan, it's the Friday weekly roll-up time where we roll up the entire week of crypto, which is always an ambitious endeavor, yet we undertake it nonetheless because that is what we do every Friday morning on the Bankless Friday weekly roll-up. Absolutely. Topics for the week, okay? Inflation over 7%. That means your dollars are worth 7% Oof. this year Oof. versus last year. 7% less. 7% less. Did I say more? You just God, said 7%. Less. It's 7% less. <laughs> That's bad, okay? <laughs> PayPal doing a stable coin. What's what? the news on that? We're also going to talk about this uh, airdrop from Looks Rare. I got my mm -hmm. Look token. Looks token. Did you get yours? Oh, I got my Looks. All right. Finally. Looks, looks bright. Like this is like an open sea competitor. We're gonna mm -hmm. dig into that. Maybe it's what we've been looking for. Not sure yet. There's some other airdrops we're gonna touch too. Also some big NFT winners this week and some losers. What are the winning projects? What are the losers? Last to unpack on the roll up. Uh, and you are freshly back. David, you're, you're back from your ice climbing trip. How was that, man? Uh, well, I didn't die, so so that's great. Right. Uh, <laughs> always God. been a big rock climber, but never been ice climbing before. And I've have I've had this like badass afterglow for the last week of just, you know, yo, I went ice climbing. That's amazing. <laughs> Dude, are we going to show those pictures like toward the end of the show? Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh -huh. that, was, that was pretty badass. Man. Hanging like, on with one arm while I'm taking a selfie. Yeah. You will uh -huh. never see me up there with you, dude. But like, I admire, I admire what you're doing. Oh, uh, serious, man. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, also, we got to tell you a little bit about our friends and sponsors at On Juno. David, tell them what On Juno is. On Juno is a checking account for crypto people. So if you're frustrated that your Boomer bank account doesn't have USDC or ETH or BTC when it totally could, use On Juno uh, because On Juno is a crypto enabled checking account. You can put USDC in there. You can also get 4% on that USDC. Uh, Ryan, how much uh, APY do you get on your deposits in your, in your uh, bank account? Okay, I know this. Uh, 0 0.01 percent in my Wells Fargo Way to Save account. Yeah, that's significantly less than the four percent that you can get on, <laughs> yes, it on is. Juno. It's also, significantly less than inflation. I, yeah, also I would that. You. Yes. <laughs> uh, and in addition to that, you can also get your direct deposit from your company sent into your On Juno account, and they will automatically convert that into crypto. So you can reduce the amount of time that you hold your inflating dollars, and it can get sent directly into actual sound, real money like Bitcoin and Ether. You can do a number of other cool things. They have a metal debit card for you where you can get like 5% cash back at select uh, Web2 type companies. Uh, Walmart comes to mind, uh, Spotify, stuff like that. Uh, and just a bunch of other features as well. So uh, if your bank account, if your Boomer bank account has not taken the crypto pill, on Juno has. Uh, so you can go and sign up with code Bankless to get $50 when you get your first direct deposit into your on Juno account. Yeah, I've never seen a bank account that can do this. This is uh, my on Juno account. Look at this. You can get started, split your paycheck, and you get to pick whether you are a, a Bitcoin maximalist, an ETH maximalist, or, or something in the middle. Uh, really cool features that on Juno is rolling out. So make sure you guys check that out and get an account. There is a link in the show notes. Uh, David, let's start with some market news of the week. Uh, get to the numbers, man. Bitcoin first. How is Bitcoin hanging in there? this second week of January 2022. Yeah, so the big red days were last week, literally eight days ago. So these seven days of price action has actually not been terrible, even though we've kind of had like a bad market. So Bitcoin is actually up 1% since like Monday. Okay. Uh, it started, though, it started, uh, and also, like, we, we, there's, we, we kind of, we essentially record these on Thursdays, but the weeks end on Sundays. There's a little bit of discrepancy. We have to sort that out. Anyways, <laughs> uh, seven days ago, the Bitcoin price was $43,000. It hit a low of $40,500 in the middle of the week. We are currently clocking in at $44,000. Oh, $42,800. Uh, so actually, since I wrote these numbers down, we must have taken a little bit of a dip because we were actually down 1.8%. So scratch that. Uh, Down 1.8%. And who knows what it'll be at the time of recording, of course. Uh, pretty choppy, pretty volatile, but definitely it's been down in 2022 mm. so far. Same story for ETH. What are we looking at on the week? Yeah, uh, ETH started the week at $3,400, which was the high of the week. It hit a low of just below $3,000. Didn't stay below $3,000 for too long. Um, we don't we don't like that 3000 Number that's that's too I low of a it. number. I hate that number. Yeah. Uh, three thousand. I'll settle for three thousand three hundred. But we are <laughs> below three thousand three hundred right now at three thousand two hundred and eighty six. What happened was that um, 
uh, the last Wednesday, uh, a week ago uh, Wednesday, the Fed minutes came out and people realized that the Fed is now are now looking at reducing their balance sheet, which means that they are going from injecting $120 million, billion dollars per month into the market to pulling out $80 billion. So a $200 billion month difference in liquidity. That spooked a lot of people, especially risk on assets like crypto assets. Uh, and that was because of perceived just like unsustainable nature of the balance sheet. Uh, and so and also inflation. Uh, and so that's what spooked the market. That's why the market's down. Uh, and then on Wednesday, when we went from uh, a price of like 3,100 to 3,400 over the course of 24 hours, that is when uh, the CPI came out and inflation wasn't worse than expected. And so people uh, said, okay, it's not, couldn't, couldn't have been worse than this. So I'm gonna go a little bit more risk on. Uh, so markets went from like 4,000 down to 3,000 because of the Fed notes and then bounced back from 3,000 up to 3,400 with ether price. Um, but since I wrote these numbers down, we are back down to $3,290 on the ether price, Bitcoin doing similar things. So that is the TLDR of the last week in crypto prices. Yeah, macro really taking center stage in the crypto markets. And, you know, Jerome Powell, and so it's like, that that 120 billion dollars that uh, they, they're buying every month right that's kind of like an asset um yeah asset stimulus program it's a price and floor it's a pr it's a Buying price floor, floor. Yeah. exactly and you know that goes into all risk on assets so i i think there's that compounded with the fact that people are wondering does the fed really know what it's doing are they right. really in control yeah. anymore or a couple roll-ups ago i called this like the jesus take the wheel uh -huh. economy it's like no one actually is steering this ship and right. you know is the fed really on top of things are they just reacting to things just like everyone else and i think that's given uh, some jitters to the market yeah. and that's going to take some time i think to work itself out so mm -hmm. i don't know what's going to happen for the rest of uh, q1 uh, but um i i think this macro stuff could be in the headlines for a while david uh, I think that's right. The actions of the Fed are similarly as volatile as the markets themselves. So it's not really <laughs> helping anyone. All right, let's look at the ETH Bitcoin ratio. Uh, so our, our numbers for Bitcoin and ETH are flat on the mm -hmm. week. Is the ratio looking pretty flat too? Yeah, flat. the ratio is up from 0 0.075 to 0 0.0767, up a tiny little bit, but still down on the like a, on a four week trend. Uh, about four weeks ago, we almost hit 0 0.09. We are currently at 0.076. Um, I would like to be above 0.08. Uh, I've said it uh, in, in episodes past, uh, and so I'll have to say it again. Like the ETH BTC ratio going up is an indication of the bull market. It's been going down the last four weeks. I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> if it's not an indication of a bull market, it's an indication of a bear market. Uh, so I'll have to be fair to myself and say that. Um, uh, it's still pretty good though. Yeah, 0 0.076, yeah. not, not too yeah. bad. Hanging in there, and Hanging in not there. knowing what to do. It's kind of like, it reminds me of the summer. We back to yeah. crab season right. for this quarter. Might be a crab season quarter. Yeah. See how that plays out. How about the bed index? That is Bitcoin, ETH, and DeFi tokens all combined a third, a third, a third on the one week. What are we looking at? Yeah, we started the week at 126. We are ending the week at 128. We are up by about 2.4%. 2.4% on the week. Uh, interesting. You know, l let's switch maybe to uh, away from away from the short term chop and back to uh, to fundamentals. So I, t I tweeted this out, David, earlier this year, like, uh, and this is kind of a earlier this week, rather, this is kind of a joke, but like, I'd rather sell an organ than sell my ETH this year, because it's a merge year. All yeah. right. Will someone take like, my kidney for ETH? <laughs> I don't know. That, you can tokenize it. Hey, it if anyone needs like my this. kidney, I got Collateral. I got a, an O plus or o, o blood type O. <laughs> you like, only need let, one, let me man. know. Let me know. You only need one. <laughs> yeah. So like, but but seriously, the fundamentals for Ether as an asset, and I think for for other assets in crypto, are looking quite strong. And now we're talking about uh, the burn. The furnace is is quite hot this week. 18k ETH burn record in a 24 hour period of time. That happened on January 10th earlier this week the biggest eth burn in a single day pretty impressive there we got some other things on the burn uh why don't you talk about this david yeah for seven days we had no net new ether issuance we had a day where ether issuance was matched by ether burn uh and actually this uh tweet is actually a little bit outdated the issuance offset uh point uh, 1.00 is actually the last time i checked it, it was 1.02 so we actually burned 2% more Ether than we issued this, so this week. So Ether supply didn't increase this week. Yes. 
is what you're saying. Yes. And like, this that doesn't sense. happen because with any other blockchains. Never, ever. Um, and this, this is, uh, is uh, likely because of volatility. One of the first articles, actually, I think the first article I ever wrote was an analysis of MKR getting burnt during times of market volatility. And I noticed that a lot of MKR gets burnt when prices go up and down really, really quickly totally. because people are paying back their debt into uh, MakerDAO and that burns MKR. And now we are seeing the same dynamic play out where market volatility creates congestion on the blockchain. People are getting liquidated, their arbitrage bots all over the place. People need to cover their positions. People need to do DeFi stuff when prices move. Uh, and so when that happens, congestion on the chain goes, goes really, really high. And so during times of market volatility, Ether gets burned the most. Uh, and so we definitely saw that with, uh, there was definitely a de decent number of liquidations um, on Saturday and Sunday of last week. Uh, and that is being reflected in how much Ether we are burning. Uh, so market volatility ultimately burns more Ether. It's definitely some of that. And, and at the same time, OpenSea uh, activity like hasn't slowed down either. So you've mm -hmm. got both the market volatility causing people to click more buttons on DeFi, and then you have OpenSea and right. NFTs going full steam ahead. That, that all adds up to a lot of burn, perfectly balanced, as mm -hmm. all things should be, is the uh, Thanos meme reference here. Um, this is a whole uh, review of 2021, the top ethereum gas consumers and right. you can see the big ones here what came in number one david yeah you for the viewers on the youtube you can watch these graphs uh the bottom is going to be the biggest and then you can see the bands get highlighted as we move up uh this is alex uh, svanovic from nansen uh, and so Uniswap coming in at number one, burning like what looks like 40%, yeah, 40% roughly of all gas in 2021. Uh, so that's pretty big, definitely taking up the majority, uh, followed by OpenSea. And you can see just the rate of adoption in OpenSea where even though it's number two, it actually didn't burn all that much gas in the first half of the year of 2021. It was all in the second half. And from the period of like August, to November, OpenSea was actually burning more ether than Uniswap and, uh, you know, or consuming gas, I guess is the more technical term. Um so that's number two, followed three by one inch, which had a nice steady ETH uh, gas consumption all throughout the year. Uh, number four is the wrapped ether contract. So that's wrapped ether being transferred around uh, that wrapped ether. Uh, okay, quick uh, dive into wrapped ether. Why does wrapped ether exist? Uh, because ether is not an ERC20 token and DeFi are, is used to ERC20 tokens. So just to make ether be on the same page as all the other tokens we use in DeFi, we have this wrapper contract called wrapped ether. People put their ether in there and then boom, ether behaves like an ERC20 token. Uh, and wrapped ether coming in number four at the most burned in 2021, followed by Tether coming in at number five, gonna blow, blow through the rest of these. USEC at number six, uh, Ave at number seven, Zero X, a Zero X exchange and Matcha coming in at number eight. Uh, number nine is MetaMask Swap and number 10 is Sushi Swap. So there you have it. There are our top 10 ETH uh, gas consumers in 2021. Yeah, pretty cool. DeFi and NFT is definitely the story. This is uh, a visual from Token Terminal. Let me see if I can uh, expand this, blow this up a little bit, um, of ETH becoming a productive asset. So this is the effect of EIP-1559 visualized. Uh, I'm playing this now. So you can see transaction fees to miners if you're on YouTube looking at this in the Aqua. And then suddenly EIP-1559 kicks in, burn transaction fees. Oh, look, look. Boom. About to hit it, like a it rocket. surpasses rocket. transaction fees to miners. The nice thing about these burn transaction fees, of course, is they go to all ETH holders. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a, um, a stock buyback mm -hmm. type progr uh, program, if you're thinking about this in terms of uh, you know, capital assets like stocks or something like that. Wait, be um, before you go on, I want to elaborate on that point because the number of miners out there are like, you know, not that many, like less than a thousand uh, individuals or entities are capturing like 95% of the value of the transaction fees going to miners. The number of ether holders out there is far more than that. It's over a million people. So we're going from like just a thousand people who receive the benefit of Ethereum transaction fees going to over a million people. And that's one of the beautiful things about EIP-1559. It democratizes the value captured by the Ethereum protocol to the maximum number of people possible that's also aligned with the Ethereum protocol, which is Ether holders. So this is a democratizing force.
Yeah, it's interesting too. I mean, this this doesn't go to whales disproportionately; it goes to everyone equally. Mm -hmm. So you you want some of this, the benefits of the stock buyback? You can just have it. own some ETH. Yep. You can have a fraction of ETH, mm -hmm. and and you receive this benefit. Uh, it's pretty cool. W one of my predictions, maybe this is kind of a, a hot take for 2022, is um, the Ethereum merge will happen this year, and historically, it'll be like a it'll be a historic milestone in the whole. You know, history of crypto. That's how it'll be viewed in the decades to come. But when it does happen in a few months' time, the time people will still be disappointed because there's this idea, David, that ETH2 and the merge uh, will actually reduce gas fees, and that's not what's going to happen. It's it's almost like a efficiency improvement. It's a monetary policy improvement, right? You're ripping out the old proof of work engine and you're installing this this hyper efficient electric engine. So we've gone from a combustion engine to an electric engine, but it is not going to alleviate gas fees. And I'm worried there's this sentiment that people think, oh, when the merge happens, suddenly gas fees on Ethereum will go away. That's not what's going to happen. That is not Ethereum's scalability strategy. So I guess a quick PSA for people who didn't realize that. And also the take there is, um, I think some people will be disappointed because there's a lot of bad information about what's going to happen in the future with Ethereum's roadmap. Any thoughts there? No, I've, I had that same question uh, while I was on a, a podcast uh, the other this, this week where like, what's going to happen to the gas fees after the merge? I don't know where that, excuse me. I don't know where that misunderstanding came from. Um, I've never heard that be iterated. I think people just assume that ETH2 has low gas fees and it kind of does with sharding. That's that's the part where Ethereum block space actually it's grows is because of sharding. a lot of, of bad information out yeah. there. It's like, mm -hmm. it's look, to be fair, it's hard to keep track of all of this yes. stuff. And yes. sometimes we use all sorts of like, technical terms. You have to kind of be in the weeds, like EIP 1559. What, like, what is that? What does that even mean? ETH2, oh, well, it sounds like an upgrade. Is the upgrade going to be faster? Well, no, it's not. Like, what does it improve? It's complicated, so I get it. But yeah, I, I'm not sure why that sentiment has, uh, has somewhat spread. The interesting thing about all of this is somebody actually put together a uh, discounted cash flow model that I thought was really neat. Oh, wow, uh, this looks amazing. Putting a link in the show notes. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool, right? So this is how analysts uh, analyze. This is done by Ryan uh, Alice. This is a discounted cash flow. It's how analysts look at capital assets like stocks or you know, you know rental properties, that sort of thing. And what's interesting about this is if you just look at it from a amount of revenue that goes to ETH as a productive asset once staking kicks in, right? Um, the value, the fair market value of ETH, if it has a PE ratio, something that would be common for a fast growing you know, tech company of 100, then ETH is massively undervalued. It should be valued at close to $12,000 per, per ETH, just because this thing is a revenue machine, all right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's December 2021 revenue was $13 billion. Wow. And remember what we said. So like the EIP 1559, all of those burn metrics that we're going back, that's stock buybacks. Mm -hmm. Okay. But basically when the merge happens and you stake your ETH, then you not only receive the stock buyback, but you also receive a dividend. You also receive uh, uh, annual you know, staking revenue Stake, rewards. Yeah. The, the block fees rewards. that are currently paid to miners go to validators. The leftovers exactly. from the burn go to the validators who stake their ETH. So that effectively is like a dividend. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening right now with Ether. And if you just value it as a productive asset, uh, it just seems hilariously undervalued at this point in time. I don't know. Bankless listeners are probably sick of us saying that, but like, hey, we're gonna I don't beat know, this man. drum until it, until it happens. Just look at the numbers, okay? Right. Just look at the numbers for yourself. Check out this discounted cash flow. And this is only if you view Ether as a productive asset, as a capital asset. Mm -hmm. When you add a monetary premium, right? So like Collateral as a productive DeFi. asset, yep. it's worth $2 trillion. Uh, but if you if you consider that it should also have a monetary premium for all of its uses as money, collateral in DeFi, uh, like what else are you gonna hold? Are you gonna hold sovereign bonds? No, you want you want a long term store of value. I mean, that feels like a four trillion dollar, five trillion dollar valuation, right? Mm -hmm. I have no idea if that's gonna happen this year, but these are just the fundamentals that I think you and I see when we look at Ether as an asset and why we talk about it so much because it just seems like a freaking no brainer. Right, it really does, it really does. Yeah. I mean, 
it can't just teleport to its fair valuation, right? Because then there's too many people that got too rich too quickly, so they got to sell. Um, so there's many dynamics about why it's not at that price, but uh, one of those dynamics about why it's not at that price is time. And so Bankless will be here talking about this until that time comes. It's just the most fundamentally strong asset in this space. In the world, uh, in, the, in the world, the think... be best asset the universe has ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're being too bullish, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it seems like a massive opportunity. All right, let's talk about Uniswap on Polygon. So it's going pretty well, David. What's happening here? Yeah, so uh, we've been covering this lately where uh, there was a proposal to put Uniswap on Polygon. It passed with overwhelming support. Uh, so now it's there. Uh, and it's only been a few weeks, tweets Hayden Adams, since launch. And Uniswap v3 is already the highest volume DEX protocol on Polygon with only 45 million TVL2. Uh, this is one of the beautiful things about Uniswap v3. It's super capital efficient. You can get a lot of liquidity with not that much capital uh, being provided in liquidity. Uh, and so no surprise that Uniswap comes to Polygon and just dominates in the DEX space. Uh, so congrats to Uniswap, congrats to Polygon, uh, congrats to DeFi and Layer 2. It's thrown off some serious revenue here too. So in 2021, Uniswap LPs, this is the liquidity providers, they made $1.6 billion worth of revenue. And Hayden says that's more than any app, any decentralized app, DeFi protocol, L1 network or L2 network, aside from Ethereum, the king itself. Pretty impressive. Uh, he also shows six other projects that are direct V2 forks of mm -hmm. Uniswap. So the Uniswap AMM model working pretty well, generating a ton of revenue for the space. And the, the highlight about this revenue, this $1.6 billion in revenue, is going to liquidity providers who never did any KYC, who never filled out a form, who never signed up with anything. This is permissionless revenue. So yes, it's $1.6 billion, but in my mind, it's the best kind of $1.6 billion, <laughs> which is the permissionless and free kind, where no one had to submit any sort of documentation to access it. It's the best how, kind of revenue. How old is Uniswap? Is this like uh, just-, no, just November. 2019. Okay, so three, just yep. you know, three years old, just, just over three, three years. Yep. Uh, in incredible how fast these protocols can grow. Mm -hmm. uh, another growth story from a market perspective: crypto browser, the Brave browser, just passed 50 million monthly active users. Of course, Brave just launched a, a crypto wallet as well. This is a more crypto native browser, and pretty cool, pretty impressive to see that growth. Yeah, um, this is not strictly crypto because Brave Brave is just a privacy. It's a uh, crypto ethos browser where crypto you get to friendly, yeah. crypto friendly. Yeah, you get to control your digital footprint. It, it's user first. It's user sovereignty. So very aligned with crypto values. And then they do have their brand new um, wallet in the browser as well, which you've heard of from the Bankless ads. Uh, so you'll hear about that later in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, speaking of bankless ads, they're about to come at you. We want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. We'll be back with the releases and the rest of the roll-up in just a minute. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet with over 50 million monthly active users. Control your digital footprint with built-in privacy and ad blocking. Inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the first secure crypto wallet built natively inside of a Web3 crypto browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy. But there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. The Brave wallet is different. Brave wallet is built natively inside the Brave browser, no extension required, which gives the Brave wallet an extra level of security versus other wallets. With the Brave wallet, you can buy, store, send, and swap your crypto assets Assets, and you can even manage your NFTs and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps, all from the security of the best privacy browser on the market. Whether you're new to crypto or a seasoned pro, it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. When you shop for plane tickets, you probably use Kayak, Expedia, or Google to compare ticket prices. So why would you limit yourself to just one exchange when you trade crypto? When you make your trades, you wanna make sure you're getting the best possible price on your trade. And that's why you should be using Matcha. Matcha has smart order routing that splits your trade across all the various liquidity sources in Ethereum. And is also operational on Polygon, Avalanche, Binance Smart Chain, and other chains. Trading on Matcha is super easy because it pools the liquidity for me in a single easy to use platform and allows me to make limit on-chain orders. So you can set and forget your DeFi trades and they will go through automatically while you're away. So when you're making a trade, head over to matcha.xyz slash bankless and connect your wallet to start getting the best prices and most liquidity when you trade your crypto assets. Bankless is proud to be sponsored by Uniswap. 
Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum that lets you trade any token at the current market price. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. The Uniswap Grants Program is accepting applications for grants. Do you have something of value that you think you want to contribute to the Uniswap ecosystem? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at uniswapgrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. All right, guys, we are back with the releases of the week. We got to start here with an airdrop and a release, a combo, double threat. Mm -hmm. Looks rare. They just released. This is a vampire attack on OpenSea, an yep. NFT trading platform, an NFT listing platform, minting platform. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of things with looks rare. Uh, what's going on here? Yeah, this is kind of, I, I think this might be the open C alternative that we've all been looking for. There's definitely some very viable mm -hmm. alternatives. Zora comes to mind, uh, like, you know, a rareable, you know, foundation, but like everyone's really looking for that, that search and organization and curation feature that open C really has done a very good job of. Uh, and looks rare.org is a brand new app on the scene, Web3 app with uh, that is closer towards the Web3 end of the spectrum than uh, than OpenSea. OpenSea is kind of, you know, two, a Web 2.5. And also, I think people have just finally uh, swallowed the pill that OpenSea, I don't think is going to be doing a token. Um, and, and so people really want an NFT platform that they can own, which means they need a token. And this platform came with token first. So they airdropped the looks token to anyone that has put three Ether of volume through OpenSea. So if you've ever bought anything more than three Ether or collected, uh, you know, collectively purchased anything more than three Ether through OpenSea, you have the looks token. We'll pull up a gra uh, chart here in a second because that number actually scales up the more volume that you put through. Three is just the minimum. Uh, in order to get your airdrop, you must list an NFT for sale. So you, you are not automatically eligible. You have to actually list an NFT that you own for sale on the Looks Rare platform. Uh, but there's some pretty interesting tokenomics. And this is, th there were angel investments. I'm not sure if there was a big VC uh, profile behind this, but there were angel investors. So there is investors in this. It's not like... Uh, the immaculate nature of ENS, where they have absolutely no investors. Uh, there are some investors behind this. Um, uh, but uh, I think so far, like it's been very, very well received by the community. A lot of the friends that I've uh, heard chit chat about this are, are excited about it. Uh, and I think that I've, I went through and I listed uh, the, the two airdrops. Uh, I, got to, I got the airdrop twice, two different wallets, and I've listed two NFTs. And that process was great. Uh, very sleek uh, UI. Um, we did ask the, the Looks Rare team to come on the State of the Nation, but since they are all anons and they are also very busy with the launch, they politely declined, which is totally fine. Um, but maybe we will talk to them in the future. Yeah, it's really cool. And I guess a vampire attack part of this, right? So like last episode, I feel like we were just talking about OpenSea, almost a good chunk of that episode. It's because OpenSea just raised $20 billion. And at that point, if you issue a token, I mean, a lot of the gains have already been realized by accredited investors, the VC side of things. Yeah. In this case, the vampire attack piece of it is basically they went through, they got all of the higher volume open seat users and they said, hey, you can take part in our equity, in our economy. We're issuing a token, we're giving that to you. And I believe, David, there's some like uh, staking incentives here. Uh -huh. So the revenue, OpenSea, of course, collects 2.5% of all trading fees, right, on the OpenSea platform. Looks Rare collects 2% of that. And then is it somehow staked? Is mm -hmm. it somehow distributed mm -hmm. to people who are staking the Looks token? Is that how this works? That's exactly right. And Ryan, you just said that OpenSea raised $30 billion. That <laughs> Not not quite. Uh, they raised uh, 30, $300 million at a $13 billion valuation. So ah, just, did I say? Well, thank you. Yeah, you. you they did not raise $30 billion. <laughs> did I say $30 billion or did You did. Okay. Yeah. I don't uh, even know what I... Okay. They raised $300 Billions. million at a $13 billion valuation. And yes, and yes they charge a 2.5% ETH uh, fee on the sales. And that goes into the OpenSea company. Uh, instead, uh, with Looks Rare, they charge 2%, uh, and that goes to people that are staking their Looks token. And uh, if you actually, you can go into the rewards page on the LooksRare.com website, Ryan, and it'll tell you the APY, which is insane. 930% APR on your Looks tokens. And this is not a pool two. This is not coming from, uh, actually, maybe, maybe, there is, maybe there actually is some inflation. 
Uh, but you are not providing liquidity on this. So you are not getting like you can people can't dump on you. It's not pool two. So that's very strong percentage of APR. Uh, and this is a combination of uh, uh, yes, this, this must be because I'm staking my looks token and I'm watching that number go up. Um, so you get more looks token when you stake. So there is some uh, in inflation there. And then you also get wrapped ether. You get wrapped ether in your wallet. And Ryan, I tweeted this out earlier today. Uh, just some of the metrics of 24 hours worth of staking on the airdrop that I got. And uh, I don't know if you have that tweet up, but let's see if we can, let's see if you can, uh, if you do. Yeah, so 24 hours into staking looks, I got 21 new looks tokens, which is about $100, and 0 0.024 ETH, which is about $80 in reward. So about $180 inside of 24 hours on my airdrop. The airdrop that I got when I claimed it, it was 42 thousand uh, dollars for the airdrop and then because uh appreciation is now up to seven thousand uh, dollars and so i kind of it's, it's a pretty compelling airdrop that's amazing uh, and mm -hmm. it's like so you're earning your that the, those earnings are denominated in eth too it's really hard to find like eth denominated right. earnings yes this is an application that is sending out ether for dividends towards its users on day one so that's in a, in of itself like a, a brand a, like a kind of a breakthrough. This is something I've always wanted. Um, it's also no wonder they're anonymous because I, I can imagine there could be some uh, securities sure. like SEC type right. concerns right. with this type of an arrangement. But I, I'm glad they're like moving the Overton window in its favor. What is the value of the Looks token here, David? Yeah. So the the last I checked it at when the Looks token was I think four point eight dollars per token, uh, four dollars eighty cents. Uh, it was valued at roughly. $4.2 billion. $4.2 billion on day one is like four, <laughs> it's a uh, lot. It's a lot. That's a, that's a, that's a big number. Uh, that's very strong. That's very strong returns for all of those angel investors who invested at, a, I don't know what valuation, but I'm, I wasn't a billion dollars. I can, I can be sure. Uh, so, you know, th this is already like a pretty highly valued token. Uh, yeah. So, you know, buyer, buyer beware, uh, but the, Hey, you know, open sea competition. Pick up your airdrop though. Yeah. You got an definitely, airdrop. Definitely right? pick up your airdrop. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, do you have that chart of the different, um, uh, airdrops, uh, tiers? If not, I can airdrop just read tiers. it out. Um, where would that be? Would that be on? I, I can just read it out. Um, yeah, read it out. Okay. So like I said, the lowest tier is that if you, uh, sent three ether through, um, uh, through OpenSea, you get 125 looks tokens. And again, looks tokens is trading about $4.5. to si uh, Six to 10 ether, you get 200 looks tokens. 10 to 20 ether, you get 400 looks tokens. 25 to 35, you get 800 looks tokens. So you can, you can um, you know, extrapolate from there. There'll be a link in the show notes to check that out. Uh, and uh, overall, there's a decent bell curve distribution. So the biggest, the people that spent the most uh, through uh, Looks Rare, who spent over a thousand ether through OpenSea, those the, the collectively those people got 4.5 million tokens. But the the biggest tier were people that spent between 35 and 120 ether through OpenSea, and collectively those people got about f um, 35,000 uh, Looks tokens c combined. So it's Rise impressive, Rise. man. Right. It's impressive. Look, and they also shipped a product like mm -hmm. day one with the airdrop, which is super impressive. And I think we're going to see this as a trend in 2022. Like we've seen a little bit last year, but uh, you'll have kind of a, I guess, a more closed, less community owned type of application, like say a, an OpenSea, for example. And then I think in 2022, what we'll see is a, a fork of that, a vampire attack of that. This is not a fork. They didn't steal OpenSea's code, but like similar concept, except rather than VC owned and kind of going public route, it'll be community owned. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're seeing. I think we'll see this repeat again and again and again in 2022. So it always pays to use crypto applications, doesn't it? I mean, all you had to do in order to be eligible is like definitely three ETH is a, a decent amount of volume mm -hmm. in NFT, but all you had to do is do that and use OpenSea and you got some free money. Crypto mm -hmm. pays you to learn about crypto, as we say so often. Uh, really cool trend to see. There's another airdrop here, David. Uh, a, a WTF, a fees.wtf mm -hmm. airdrop. People might happening. know this website as the website that you don't want to go look at when you look at how much money you spent on gas. Well, is um, this your account? Did you really spend uh, two point five million dollars? I did not spend two point five million on gas. This is some <laughs> okay. random. This is some random address. Uh, but uh, at the time of recording, this contract unlocks in about six hours, so you it will already be unlocked by the time that you listen to this. No clue what the token does. 
Uh, unless no I, I, I have no clue why they need a token. For the, the, why do we need a token for uh, how much gas you've spent? I don't know. Maybe what they actually plan cases? to do something of it. Um, yeah. One of the big reasons why I haven't sold my Lux tokens is because I'm staking it and it's giving me Ether. Uh, the only way that I know that I can get Ether from this new fees.wtf airdrop is by selling it for Ether. So, you know, <laughs> what, what is your purpose? <laughs> you, you get sold for Ether. <laughs> that, that is just my personal take. That is what's perhaps what I'm doing until I see it, any further information. That's beautiful about airdrops. People can yeah. do whatever they want with them. If you, right. you know, spend the time to research this project, then you can hold. If, if you don't, then just sell. Uh, right. Or you could stake in some cases. Uh, maybe really there's cool. something that people know that I don't. And maybe I should be much more bullish on it. But until then, selling it for ETH. By the way, on that, on that trend of, of looks rare, here's a community-owned wallet for the open internet. This looks like it's uh, maybe trying to take the MetaMask play and create a community-owned version of MetaMask. The wallet is called Tally at tally.cash. Uh, what do you make of this? Yeah, free open source software, kind of true to the nature of you know, crypto, which is free and open source. Um, uh, they, they, they do take a swing at MetaMask for having a license on it, but you know, can you really blame them? Uh, for having a license. Some people can. I guess uh, this wallet does. Uh, definitely s interested in seeing more and more competition in the wallet space. Uh, and so I'm excited to try this out. I have not yet tried it out. Yeah, these wars between sort of community owned versus VC owned, mm -hmm. the net result of them, there's like mud back and forth and like there's all sorts of noise about it. But the end result is consumers get better products and the Certainly. industry moves forward faster. So I'm Certainly. all about it. Bring on the competition. Big Let's time. go. Love it. Uh, this is pretty cool too. Index Co-op, in partnership with Bankless DAO, they just released a new index called the GMI, gonna make it index. What's in the GMI index, David? What is this thing? Yeah, a bunch of the newer tokens that aren't in the DPI. And I think that's really what this angle of the GMI token is. Uh, a lot of uh, newer DeFi projects have moved faster than what the parameters of the DPI index allow for inclusion with. Uh, so there's a bunch of tokens in here that are not in DPI. Things like Toke from Tokamak, um, Maple Finance, CVX, Perp from Perpetual Protocol, uh, Spell, Tribe, uh, FLX from Reflexor, uh, a bunch of different stuff. Also a very balanced index. There's nothing really with that has really too much outsized um, uh, outsized proportion of it. So uh, Bankless DAO just churning out the products. Yeah, the streaming fees, 1.95%. So 1.95% of the market cap of the GMI index goes, splits between the Bankless DAO and Index Co-op. Uh, and Bankless DAO uh, got two products on the Index Co-op as, as index, both the BED index, of which we talked about, and the GMI index. Uh, so kind of taking the lead with uh, using Index Co-op to churn out some awesome indices. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Good to see more indices enter the market too. Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about this next thing, which is EtherScan. Man, I, there's not a day that goes by that uh, I don't use EtherScan, yep. and I'm not always thankful. Uh, you know, I don't always think about it, but mm -hmm. um, because it's just like become second nature to me. It's like kind of like Google, but uh, it is the most it's, useful tool. It's crazy in, too. in crypto. Uh, yeah. Crazy useful. Now they're adding some more features. So this is an NFT feature. Mm -hmm. So it allows for the on-chain NFT, like you can track trading and minting in Etherscan's new NFT tracker. What are we looking at here, David? It's just a UI UX upgrade. Um, people, you can already see when you're trading NFTs, but now you can see what NFTs. Uh, so just a, a small, might mean medium uh, UX increase in improvement to uh, Etherscan, which are, they're always shipping. And it's crazy how good Etherscan has been even before DeFi was like, good like it like etherscan was a good product before anything else on ethereum it's was a, really a good, good product, product. <laughs> i don't know what would happen if etherscan went down like oh i would be yeah. beside myself <laughs> ether, ether blocks of io just doesn't doesn't <laughs> yeah. have it let's talk uh, some lt releases we're going to burn through some of these uh, mm -hmm. immutable is now permissionless so it used to be mm -hmm. permission you used to have to fill out some paperwork in order to get on immutable now you don't anyone can enter the theme park is open anyone can set up a ride uh, and they're doing some serious volume here mm -hmm. too. So they've just hit a thousand test contracts that are registered on Immutable X uh, in just two months. The number has skyrocketed 4X. So insane growth for Immutable X. Seriously impressed with their traction. Yeah, the, the, this is what happens when you have free 
NFT fees. This is the beauty of layer two. Stuff free block is, space. It's free block space. Yeah, it's free real estate. It's free real estate. <laughs> the Z, ZK rollups are just pure magic. And this is why Ryan and I are, are just harping on layer twos is because layer twos is where you get the fastest and most free kind of transactions. And Immutable is definitely getting the adoption based off of that. So congrats to Immutable. DYDX also based on layer two, of course, using a, a ZK a layer two. technology, yeah. mm -hmm. ZK layer two, really cool advanced stuff. Feels like a centralized exchange, but it's not. And now they are fully decentralizing. There's a whole blog post about this that we'll include in the show notes. But I think the line is they are planning to, in V4, their newest launch by the end of 2022, be fully decentralized uh, in the implementation of the DYDX protocol. So that means no central party has the ability to receive fees on V2 or V4. It will just be the DYDX token holders, I believe, and the parameters of which governance kind of, you know, sets what those trading fees actually are. I'd love to pick their brain about, uh, you know, the nuances of this. Like, what about the front end? Is the front end still going to be centralized? Things like a liquidity uh, protocol have done a fantastic job incentivizing other front ends. Uh, yep. When we say fully decentralized, are we also talking about the front end? And what about the other components of decentralization? But they are doing what we like to see, which is decentralizing. So, Moving cool. in that direction is always great to see. We will always support it. All about that at Bankless. Um, Tons of stuff going on with Optimism. Dude, man. Optimism just... had a killer week. You want, you yeah. want to burn through these, Ron? Yeah, so they went permissionless. They opened up their doors to the theme park for all applications the third week of December. Now, one month later, what are we seeing here, David? Oh, my gosh. Matcha is now on Optimism. So one of the most used DEX aggregators is on Optimism. So congrats to Matcha. We also have Tornado Cash. So if you have a doxed wallet uh, and you want to regain your privacy, Tornado Cash on the Ethereum L1 is pretty like gas intensive. It requires a lot of computation to do, its, to do its duty. So it makes it much more sense to be on Optimism. So Tornado Cash, now on Optimism, if you want to undox yourself, you can bridge your ETH over to Optimism and use Tornado Cash there for much reduced fees. Set Protocol, also now on Optimism. Uh, the OGs will remember Set Protocol. It was a big topic during the, the bear market, 2018, 2019. Uh, they, uh, they are one of the teams that is responsible for helping Index Co-op spin off. Uh, and so that's definitely where some of their energies have been. Other, since then, been kind of quiet, but they are now on Optimism with their token sets. Uh, so check that out. Um, and, and also, in addition to that, uh, Optimism, uh, all of these like, uh, uh, all sequencers of layer twos, people that p produce blocks, they just like on the Ethereum L1, they take they can take transaction fees and MEV, uh, and that's this is a very significant conversation to be had because of so many different things that are related to who gets the money that is value extracted from layer twos. And Optimism, as a part of just its ethos, its values, is giving away all of its profits to donated towards public goods. Uh, so in the last year, Optimism, optimism of all the adoption it has had, is, is you know sending out the blocks, sequencing the blocks, which is eventually going to be decentralized. Um, but last year, they donated $1 million to open source projects on Ethereum. And then they finish up saying, over the course of hashtag L222, layer two, 2022, we'll be giving away significantly more. So this is one of the reasons why I'm I'm super excited about optimism because they are committed to public goods and public goods get me all hot and bothered <laughs> me too david <laughs> <laughs> and of course like all rollups they're they're speeding up so uh fees on optimism just got a nice uh reduction so uh more incremental improvements going on all the time in rollup land transaction fees now 30 percent cheaper than last week and that will continue to happen as well um, we're also seeing some applications go to alternative layer ones too this is zirion deploying on avalanche so you can now track and trade all your avalanche assets directly on zirion cool to see them expanding as well uh, last thing and all of these layer twos this is really cool there's now a fiat on ramp so you have the ability to buy crypto directly on a layer two in your Argent wallet. Of course, Argent switched from main chain to uh, ZK Sync, which is a ZK rollup. Uh, and again, some of these terms, you know, mainstream, by the time this is fully ready for mainstream, they won't have to worry about any of it, right? It's like, they don't care about ZK rollups or, you know, ZK Sync or any smart contract wallets for that matter. They'll just see, oh, cool, here's an app, super easy to use. 
uh, I can deposit directly from my bank account, and now I can use cool DeFi stuff, which uh, is not inflating away at 7% per year mm -hmm. and gives me a higher interest rate than 0.01% in my Wells Fargo bank account. So I'm just going to click some buttons and make that happen. Yep. That's how the mainstream experience will, right. will feel, and I feel like we're uh, getting closer to that all the time. All right. No one these days log says, I'm going to go log into the World Wide Web using my TCP IP. <laughs> like, that's not what we talk about. There's a take later on in the show where we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, some raises, maybe the only one to highlight this week. Not really a raise, it was an acquisition, but Coinbase bought this company called FairX uh, to launch crypto derivatives. I've not heard of, of FairX. But Coinbase getting into the crypto derivatives market, I think, is a big move. I guess maybe derivatives are ready for Coinbase. They've been holding back. You know, FTXs of the world, the Binances of the world have outstripped them recently. Uh, hopefully, Coinbase plans to, uh, to catch up a little bit. I guess that's probably their plan with this acquisition. So that is happening as well. Uh, anything else on that, David? Yeah, FTX really putting the fire under Coinbase. Cause, yeah, FTX gets their it's name on, on the, the Miami Heat arena. And then yep. boom, what does Coinbase do? Uh, they, they get a partnership with uh, the NBA, I think. And then uh, FTX signs on uh, somebody like Tom Brady. And then boom, what does Coinbase do? I think they got Steph Curry. Uh, <laughs> and then and, uh, you know, uh, FTX really big on crypto derivatives. Boom, what does Coinbase do? Acquires Ledger or FairX. Uh, so this is why competition is always good for the consumer. Absolutely, totally. I, I mean, I, I think this battle will play out in the years to come. There'll mm -hmm. be uh, two titans clashing in this mm -hmm. way. Um, but you don't have to get involved, or you could. You could go get a job in crypto on our jobs job. board. Get a That's job. the Bankless dot palette dot xyz job board now's the time 2022 it's the beginning of 2022 you're probably evaluating things probably have some new year's resolutions you're trying to keep maybe one of those things is to get a job in crypto crypto is always hiring all right we are in still a secular bull run we will be for the next decade mm -hmm. So there are lots of opportunities to plug in. Here's a senior full if you, stack If you engineer. don't have enough crypto and you want more, the best thing you can do is get more exposure to crypto by working in crypto. Absolutely. I, you know, some of these positions probably come with uh, token upside as well. Uh, senior full stack engineer at Syndica. There's a senior software engineer at Gilded. There is a founding full stack engineer at Utopia Labs, a community ecosystem lead at DYDX as well. That's all we have time to highlight a ton more on the Bankless job board. So go ahead and check that out. Oh, I don't have to dance that long today. It's lovely. <laughs> Guys, uh, news time. David, do you want to start with the CPI story? I know we alluded to it, but like yeah. CPI, that's consumer price index. So your shelter, your groceries, like the stuff you you know, the stuff that you pay for in your everyday life has just gone up 7% over the past year. It's the highest inflation has been mm -hmm. since 1982. We all remember like parents, people in our lives talking about the 1970s being crazy for inflation. Well, we're starting to see it again. Transitory inflation, not so transitory. What's uh, what's happening here? Yeah, inflation clocking in at 7%, which is crazy. And, and I think I actually want to start with a little anecdote that I remember during the 2019, 2020 era of DeFi. There was a time where there were multiple years, two plus years where MakerDAO had a 0% or 0.5% interest rate. Stability fee is what they call it, interest rate on their DAI. So it was extremely cheap to borrow DAI. All you would have to do is deposit Ether into MakerDAO. You could borrow DAI basically for free. Uh, and that's because the, the die uh, was always pegged to the dollar pretty damn well. And as soon as the bull market hit, the die started to lose its peg. Uh, and so it went from $1 down to 98 cents, down to 96 cents. It got even as low as 94 cents because the ether price kept on going up and up and up and up and up. Uh, and so in your brain, think S&P going up, right? Like the, the, the market goes up. There's more capital in the market. And when there's more capital, people can borrow more. And DAI is minted when more people borrow uh, more uh, by depositing more Ether. And so when Ether doubles, they have the same amount of Ether, but you can borrow twice as much. So the DAI supply just got out of control. And so MakerDAO started to like increase their stability fees. They went from 0.5% uh, to 1.5%. Then they went to 2.5%. And then the DAI peg got even worse. It got down to like 92 cents. And so like Rune had called MakerDAO governance and was like, yo guys, I think we might need to be really, really aggressive with the interest rate. Like I'm thinking like perhaps plus above 10%. In order to restore the peg, the, they had, the MakerDAO governance had to increase the stability fee up to 19.5% before the DAI 
pay got back down to a dollar. And this is kind of a similar mandate that the Fed has. The Fed has a, a, a demand for price stability, where MakerDAO pegs their die stably to the US dollar. The US dollar just needs to be pegged towards a basket of goods. And right now, it's not being pegged towards a basket of goods because of how inflation is 7%. So there's a nice little anecdote uh, about how DeFi works and how it's this, kind of the same in the, the traditional world. And I think that's what's going on here. I think the Fed had a moment in the last few weeks where they realized that like, yo, it's not gonna take like a marginal increase in interest rates. Like it's gonna take an aggressive increase in interest rates to combat inflation. Uh, and so that's, I think, why part, uh, part, part of the story of why the markets are down this week and what, why people are freaking out because people see the, fret, the Fed People are freaking out because they see the Fed freaking out about how high the interest, uh, the inflation is. And so they are projecting high interest rates in order to combat that inflation. And they have to do this without breaking the economy, which is the tight walk that the Fed has to uh, has to walk. And it's pretty tricky. But like for, for the average person, I mean, you look at 7 percent and this just looks broken. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you did you get a 7 percent raise this year? Yeah. Oh, if not, yep. then you actually lost money. Mm -hmm. You got like, a, you know. Yeah. A, a real term you're pay earning, cut. Yeah, you're earning less than you were last year. In real terms, uh, yeah. We're talking about ba your, your, uh, bank accounts, right? They call it a savings account, and they give you 0.01% interest. It's just, it's just embarrassing. How, how does a bank even call it a savings account when right. you're losing 7% per year? You can't possibly make that up on the interest. So this starts to feel like a, a broken economy. And I think people are looking to the Fed to uh, to get a hold of this. It's not just the Fed's responsibility, right? Like fiscal policy comes into play here. Uh, and anyway, it's going to be an interesting decade as we watch some of these dynamics around money supply playing out. But uh, this is the case for crypto, isn't it? I mean, crypto people have been saying that this would happen for a while. Totally. And, uh, and here it is. Sorry, sorry if people didn't like the buzzer. Um, I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I like the buzzer. Good buzzer, David. Yeah, I don't this think was uh, that's coming. This was a good post. Um, first impressions of Web three. This is somebody from the uh, the Signal application, I believe, kind of a, you know, a founder or someone involved in that project, which is a great privacy centric messaging application. Uh, and I don't know what what did you make of this article when you read it, David? Yeah, this uh, the the takeaway was that um, while these foundations, the blockchains may be decentralized themselves and some, some things on them may also be decentralized like DeFi, things up the stack are less decentralized. And so the take is like, yeah, we have these decentralized base layers, but like the things on a lot of the things on top of them are not decentralized. And this goes into the question of like, where does the data for your JPEG actually live? Is that on a blockchain? Because like if your if your JPEGs any more than a sig very small file size, uh, the answer is no. Very, very few NFTs actually have the image stored on on chain, uh, and that's actually why things like autoglyphs out of uh, Larva Labs are so popular. Fun fact: CryptoPunks are actually on the Ethereum blockchain, but the average NFT does not have the data on the blockchain, and that's just one example of how there is centralization worked into different spots around the Web3 world, and that was the critique out of Moxie here. Uh, just parts parts of the applications that we use aren't. Decentralized, they are censorable. Uh, they have uh, weak attack vectors, and so the critique is like, "Yo, what is this Web three thing? If it's if it has all these potential attack vectors, uh, what's your take, Ryan?" Yeah, I I think he brings up a good point. It's something we've we've known for a while, and it's it, you know it's not just like the, the the image themselves and the storage isn't decentralized, but actually like accessing mm -hmm. the JPEG is also uses. Uh, APIs from centralized companies. So if OpenSea went away, for for instance, did you know you probably wouldn't be able to see the NFT in your MetaMask wallet, at least for some period of time, because MetaMask and many of the different wallets, they just call OpenSea for that indexing data to tell them which NFT is what. Um, my take here is that uh, I think he raises some good points, but that also the crypto industry is not unaware of these things mm -hmm. and he might not appreciate the um the extent to which like we're working on them and the extent to which um like we're taking them seriously this was a a post from vitalik who just actually commented on moxie's post uh and you know he said he said this this stuck out at me um because one of the things moxie said is like oh if you're going to call this space decentralized why hasn't it actually become decentralized why hasn't it happened yet mm -hmm. vitalik said this 
As far as my theory, as for my theory about why this hasn't happened yet, I would say a lot of it comes down to limited technical resources and funding. It's easier to build things this lazy centralized way, and it takes serious effort to do it right. The Ethereum ecosystem did not have that much resources up until four years ago. And I think that is really the theme or probably the response from the crypto community is basically like, yeah, you know, we're taking some, we're using some Web2 infrastructure. We have to take some, you know, temporary shortcuts and centralize things that long term we want to decentralize, but we are working to decentralize them over time. Vitalik gets into some more technical details about how light clients can actually prove uh, to be a better, more decentralized uh, kind of access layer for some of these things. And also the work that, you know, the graph is doing, for, for example, as an indexer to decentralize itself. So it's kind of a work in progress. I feel like this was a, a good critique. Um, it's a good reminder. Definitely good reminder, elements of truth. And also that we're still early in the crypto industry. Uh, at least the, the parts that, that we love the most are working on these things to start decentralizing them over time. Yeah, I 100% agree. When we... Uh when we created crypto, everyone, applications on the internet, we're good at making Web 2 applications. Like developers have gotten mastered the Web 2 universe. The Web 3 universe is a new universe. Uh, and so it's not like we can just immediately be imbue all of these applications with everything, uh, all components of decentralization. Some things are easier to decentralize than others. For example, DYDX was non-custodial from the very beginning, but it's always had centralized servers in doing the, the orders. And that and like some things are easy to tackle, some things are hard, and we just need more innovation to tackle the rest of the things. Uh, and so I, I would just like to say that like it's it's we just have to wait for the decentralization of the of the base layer to work its way up the stack into the application totally. layer. Totally, and we're we've already seen it happen. So do yes. you remember a time where there was only centralized exchanges, right? There was, yep, there was totally. no such thing as DeFi. There yep. were, if you wanted to exchange one crypto asset for another, you had to go to Coinbase and you had to use a centralized right. exchange and somebody could look at that and, and be critical or they could just wait a couple years yep. and now we have tons of decentralized exchanges. Right. So we are working our way up the stack, uh, wholeheartedly believe, but uh, good post, good reminder. There's also a uh, some downtime for Arbitrum that happened this week. Uh, a few hours of downtime on the Arbitrum sequencer. So why did Arbitrum go down, David? And uh, what did that mean? I don't actually know the, the how or why it went down, but this is what happens when you have a centralized sequencer, you know, single point of failure. The sequencer is down, therefore Arbitrum is not producing blocks. So assets are can't move on the Arbitrum layer two, they can be withdrawn from the layer two, but they can, can't really do have like the, the super fast transactions or super low fees on Arbitrum. I think it was down for uh, four or five hours or so. Um, and I actually haven't read the, the postmortem about it, but- yeah, I um, think there was some equipment failure or something mm -hmm. and sort of their the redundant equipment, their redundant hardware- Somebody like accidentally out. kicked the power cord. <laughs> yeah, somebody kicked the power cord. Um, yeah, but so the, the, the thing about this is of course, uh, this is less severe in my mind mm -hmm. than a layer one going down, right? Yes. Because layer twos always have layer one to, to fall back. But I think an interesting hatch. question, an escape hatch, an interesting question is, okay, well, so during that five hours of time, during that outage window, uh, could people actually withdraw to the L1? Like it's a good time to test yeah. this, uh, this, this theory. And what's interesting about that is like number one for rollups, optimistic rollups, is actually the withdrawal period takes seven days. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen immediately. Uh, and the second thing is it's not easy to do that right now. Yeah. Like it takes some command line, technical skills, digging into the code to actually execute a withdrawal. Um, and so user interfaces, easy user interfaces aren't available to do that. Um, but the fact that you can, that this bridge exists, also means user interfaces are getting spun up and going to be spun up to make withdrawals easier if this happens again. So yeah, it's, it's different when an L2 goes down versus an L1, but it can seem similar, I think, to people if they don't have an right. easy way to actually exercise and use that escape hatch. And we're not there yet, like we right. don't have easy user experiences to, to be able to go back to layer one. Right, we know that it is technically possible to do this. So if you had your money on there, you would be technically able to do that. It would just be a matter of just like uh, making the effort to like, if you don't know how to code, you gotta go find a developer, you need some instructions, stuff like that. But you know, it's technically possible. Now the next step in the L2 ecosystem is making it easy. I know teams like uh, L2B are working on having front ends for every single significant rollup. So you can just press a button there. And this is a very solvable problem. 
Uh, and just like, like you said, uh, this is uh, fast chains, like opt optimistic rollups, are unstable chains. Fast equals unstable. We can do some optimizations. We're going to make these things stable, more stable over time. But if you want fast, you have to commit to some amount of instability. That's just how it works. And that's why fast chains belong on the layer twos, because you don't want unstable L1s. Because imagine if Ethereum was a fast chain, and then Ethereum halted or went down, every single L2 would be stuck. Like you wouldn't be able to get you're your dead. money off of any, you're dead, you're, you're dead, <laughs> yeah, you're dead. It's yeah. gone, so it's over. <laughs> stability on the layer one, speed on the layer two. That's how it works. Yeah, let's talk about the NFT game, some cool stuff going on in the NFT world. Uh, AP, this is Associated Press, they just doubled down on NFTs. So they're launching a marketplace for some of their iconic images, a ton of really fantastic images from the Associated Press over the years. They are doing this these photography NFTs on Polygon as well. Really cool to see, I guess, literally mainstream media entering the NFT market. Yeah, um, an NFT, uh, a photo, uh, NFT photography marketplace is... Do you feel like that's a nascent space? Like, it hasn't really been developed yet? I, mean, I, I hope so. Um, yeah. uh, photography was my, like, side gig throughout high school and college, so it holds a, a special place in my heart. Um, one of the, my frustrations with the industry was that, like, in order to pay bills, I would have to take, like, photos, photographs for events. And that wasn't, like, my creative expression, right? Uh, and this yeah. is the power of, of Web3. We can unleash creativity. Shout out to the podcast coming out on Monday with Lee Jin and the creator economy and what crypto protocols can do to unleash everyone's internally native kernel that they have inside of them. Get paid for your creativity now? Mm -hmm. Really yes. hard to do that these days, but yep. uh, more opportunities coming with Web3. Uh, this is this is cool as well. Why don't, why don't you talk about this? So it seems like Nas is doing <laughs> something in the space NFT space. Yeah, people will will remember our two episodes that we've done with Blau, uh, the DJ Blau, who has the Royal platform. Uh, Ryan might call him Three Lau. <laughs> Sorry. Ryan. <laughs> um, Royal is a tokenized music platform. So if you like a song and you think that it is going to be a hit, you can buy a song and receive royalties. And now Nas has joined Royal or will be joining Royal. No, it has joined Royal on the 11th, so two days ago, and is selling royalty rights to two of his songs as NFTs. So music NFTs really taken center stage lately. The, the vision with uh, for, for Blau, or Three Lau, as you like to call him, David, <laughs> <laughs> is like, you know, turn Spotify into, into a marketplace, into an ownership economy. So you mm -hmm. find some hot artists that you really, you really like their music, buy mm -hmm. some royalty license and receive a piece of that in the right. future. Pretty awesome uh, what that unlocks for Ima creators and fans. Imagine you're like going out to like Starbucks and like a song that you own comes on. Imagine how good that would feel. <laughs> That would oh, be yeah. amazing. I, I just made money. Yes, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm making coffee, money like... right now. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Uh, pudgy penguins. Let's talk about. Let's talk about some drama, right? So like, there's NFTs are things. up. NFTs are down. Which yeah, ones? Yeah, so, some some are up, some are down. But uh, penguins are down. They're they're down bad because yeah. some drama's going on. I haven't been following this closely. What's tell us? Well, it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg as to which uh, what came first. Did the prices go down and then drama happened, or did drama happen and then prices went down? Perhaps a yes. little bit of both. So it's a flywheel. There's some drama with the team uh, because I, and my my kind of take here is that because the pudgy penguins never really really caught on as much as the other NFT projects. Uh, the prices never really did the things that other NFT projects. So that's frustrated the founders. And the, the drama is that they are looking just to sell the project. Uh, you can so, do that? Apparently. I didn't know okay. you could do that. Um, I, I mean, I guess somebody owns the admin keys for that. Uh, and so they well, they wanted to list the project for a pretty large sum of Ether, something over 1,000 Ether. No one took a bid. Uh, they dropped that price down to 888 Ether. I'm not sure anyone took a bid on that either. Um, but they are looking just to exit the project because I think they are just kind of done with it. Uh, except the thing is, like, it's the Pudgy Penguins community is strong. Like, it's not like the community is absent. There's just friction between the founding team and the community. And so, like, what I'm kind of hopeful for, Ryan, is that this kind of turns into, like, a sushi swap story, where it's just the perhaps less aligned founders. And I, I do not know the full story here. I do not know there's uh, the, the founders, there's takes and sides to, to unpack on both sides. So I'm just giving some preliminary takes. My take here is that the founders are just not as committed, they're ready to move on, but the community wants new leadership. 
Uh, and so this is kind of like the community taking over, hope maybe taking over the project and finding a new leader to spearhead the Pudgy Penguins project into perhaps new successes. Perhaps this is a sushi swap moment uh, where like, you know, it starts off good, then it fails and doesn't get the traction because, you know, some, some maligned founders and then the community takes over and takes it from there. I don't know. Um, d a disclaimer, I guess I have like three penguins, I think. Um, maybe four. Um, you know, my take is we don't have this kind of drama in the turtle community, okay? So I don't know what you penguins are doing. <laughs> but When's the last time that you've talked to a number, a member of your turtle community? No Ryan? drama, all right? In fact, it's it's silent most of the time. Completely silent. <laughs> that's how drama-free it is. Turtles don't make noise. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, that's true. Uh, well, let's talk about some, some NFT Winners. projects that are going up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the W is this week. Doodles is one. What's happening here? Yeah, Doodles. I, I, I didn't get the Doodles, but other people do. do uh, doodles just caught on a ton of What's bids. a Doodle look like? Uh, yeah, I what does a doodle, doodle look like? Here's Doodle uh, number six. They definitely six, look like Doodles. That's for nine, sure. one, four. There, there's okay, king, that's king a doodle. doodle. King Doodle. That's a yeah. king? Oh, I would, God. I oh, that's, that's $5 million dollars for King Doodle? That's Well, that's the current offering. Um, yeah. But yeah, that is like the best Doodle out there. Click the, click the Doodle link on the top center so we can look at some more Doodles. Um, my opinion on these is that they don't really dif differentiate themselves as much, but people are really, really liking them. Uh, and so Doodles really won the NFT market uh, lately. Um, yeah, number go up. They're, they're crushing it. Their floor price above 10 ETH right now. Yeah, at uh, the start of the November, it looks like the floor price was around 1.5 to 2, and now it's at 10. And that is what? only one of two winners uh, in the NFT market. We gotta ask, we gotta ask Carly what's going on. Overpriced JPEGs, Carly. Uh, another bankless show. It's just, uh, yeah, what's all going, about NFTs. What's I'm going sure on with the, the dudes? <laughs> what's going on with the doodles? <laughs> Send dudes. Uh, this is cool. This project, uh, World of Women. So, mm -hmm. W. W O W. Mm -hmm. uh, I always think of World of Warcraft, but they are crushing it as well. This is another project on the ascent. Mm -hmm. Looks like they're getting a lot of celebrities mm -hmm. purchasing these World of Women uh, NFTs. Legendary music manager, mm -hmm. known as uh, Guy O'Sara, has just bought. Is, is that how you pronounce his name, or am I making an embarrassing celebrity? Thing I don't again, know. Dude? This is the first time I've heard God, of his you name. You don't as know well. either. Okay, we're both we're both boomers. Fifteen million worth of NFTs in the last week were sold mm -hmm. of these. Wow. Uh, NFTs. P pretty cool. What's going on? E Eva Longoria, I mm -hmm. think I saw last week, uh, purchased one. Mm -hmm. What's uh, What do you make of this? Yeah, I think uh, all the NFT ladies or DeFi ladies that I know who are into NFTs have a world. Uh, they're flexing their, their world of women NFTs. So <laughs> ve ve world of women NFTs, very hot with the ladies. So if you're trying to impress a lady friend, perhaps get her a world of women NFT. And maybe that's, that's why the price is going up. Uh, I do think that some of these look really, really cool. Um, uh, they're just have these gradients. They have a very artistic, uh, la ladies love the world of women NFTs. Um, I know Cami Russo has one. I know Aubrey Strobel has one. Yeah, uh, I see it. Yeah. Right. Well, right when Beyonce, should... huh? Yeah. When... Jay-Z's got, <laughs> oh, Jay-Z has yeah. a CryptoPunk, right? Imagine yeah, Beyonce. Certainly. Yeah. She's got to get one. Yeah. CryptoPunk plus world of women collab relationship. Love it. Love it. God. Oh, that's going to happen too. Mm -hmm. We just predicted it here. All right. Uh, let's, let's keep moving. NBA Top Shots, they are banning users right now. This is uh, mm -hmm. on the Flow blockchain, NBA Top Shots, the application specifically. This is um, purported to be an NFT platform as well. Seems kind of anti-crypto to start banning users, mm -hmm. particularly like for geopolitical reasons, like mm -hmm. bending over to authoritarian nation state pressures. Uh, am I reading too much into this or what's going on? Um, that's, that's the signal that I'm hearing because we know that the NBA has bent the knee to Chinese influence before so that there's very strong precedent before the NBA. And, and this is actually a global macro problem at, at, at large. Like every, I mean, I'm gonna swear, everyone's kind of the China's bitch. Like they own all of our assets, they own our stock markets. Uh, they like, uh, they kind of control us. Uh, they, they control Hollywood, they control the narrative. Like if you say something bad about China, you can't, that you can't put that in Hollywood. Uh, that's a, the listen to the Hidden Forces podcast about this with Dimitri. If you want to unpack that a little bit more, I think it's a, a systemic problem, but it's outside the scope of the Bankless podcast. Except when a blockchain like Flow from which from Dapper Labs has NBA top shots on top of it, that's banning a, banning users and freezing assets because of a free Hong Kong username. Uh, I don't think that has explicitly been stated. As in that was why uh, they they just said that uh, the user. 
provided false or misleading information during the verification process, according to an email, and they said that this activity breaches one or both of the top shot terms and use of the Dapper Lab ser uh, service terms of use. Maybe it was something else. Uh, I don't know. But the fact that they can ban them. Blockchain, right? Ryan, don't the ban people. Blockchains right. cannot freeze stuff. And so this is why I have always had a grudge against Flow and Dapper Labs, because if you can freeze something, you're not a blockchain, you're a database. You're not permissionless, you're permissioned. And so I tweeted out uh, this morning, said, hey, Dapper Labs, the, the, the guys behind Flow, the blockchain that, that NBA Top Shot is built upon. And I said, if you can ban a user on NBA Top Shots for a free Hong Kong username and freeze their assets, you don't deserve to call yourself a blockchain. The name NFT requires strong property rights. Your NFTs are fraudulent. Get GTFO out of here. I guess that's a little bit redundant. Your NFTs are fraudulent. Your, the tokens only work if they're actually tokens on a blockchain with strong property rights. If you can take someone's NFT from them, it's not an NFT. Stop using the word NFT. That's our word. You don't JPEG. get to use it. Yeah, you get to use a JPEG. Like your <laughs> NFTs are fake. Our NFTs are real. Get the hell out of here and stop with this decentralization theater because you're harming users by freezing their assets and taking away their accounts. Okay, so some people are listening to that and they're going to feel like you came down too strongly on this, David. So you know, what do you think about that? It's like, do you think that's being a little too decentralization uh, maxi mm. about this blockchain? Do you think there's a role to play for NFT platforms that are more centralized, like Flow, what would you say to somebody who, who you know, says that? I think Dapper Labs in China came on too hard on this particular user. <laughs> uh, like, I'm sorry, like, I, I, will take, I will take the blame that uh, perhaps I have been too critical on other, other blockchains, uh, which I'm tr working on. That's one of my resolutions in 2022 to not harp be, be on- Be kinder? Uh, be kinder to some uh, of the blockchains out there that have meaningful adoption. Uh, things like Avalanche, things like Solana, uh, gonna be kinder to them moving forward. But, but David I'm, gets fired up when there's a, free, a freezing account episode. When you can freeze happens. an account, like you gotta draw the line somewhere, Ryan. And I draw the line at China using its nation state influence to control a blockchain and a user funds like I'll, at some point i would but the decentralization maxi comes out like i'm sorry i do feel like that this is part of uh, at least our role in the space or bankless's role or like what i feel like i, I care about most uh, mm -hmm. I, i've noticed a lot uh, in just kind of mainstream you know reddit and such just different subreddits people hating on the term metaverse because they're like, what is metaverse? Mm -hmm. It seems like this virtual reality world that Facebook wants to control to suck out all of our energy and trap us into their ad platform. And like, we've been there, done that. We don't want part of Mark Zuckerberg's uh, dystopia. Right. And I'm like, I, I, I see that and I'm like, my God, now Facebook gets to co-op the term metaverse, right? I'm like, hell no. The metaverse is about strong property rights. Not about virtual reality, it's about strong property rights. So I do get fired up and I do agree that there, there's things that we have to do in the space to like um, make sure that we have crisp definitions of things. And in NFT, the term does imply some level of property rights. It might not be Ethereum main chain level property rights, but it has to fall somewhere in the in the in the spectrum of cannot be censored. Yes. Or else it is no longer an NFT. Yes. It becomes the thing we already had in the past, which is just a JPEG selling for an exorbitant price. And I'm not sure where exactly that line is, but I agree, David. When you start to see censorship, when you start to see banning, when you start to see like some authoritarian pressure being put down on a platform and then it just like kind of crumbles away. Like that is where you have to start drawing the line. And I do think that's partially our role in the space. So mm. let, like, let's definitely be nice, you know, compassionate, mm. but like, I, I think this is part of um, what, uh, what we need to do as, uh, as people on the bankless journey is like mm. appreciate and respect uh, decentralization and evangelize for it. Tell people why it matters so much. Absolutely, yeah, and, and to their credit, Avalanche, Solana, I haven't, I haven't heard of any of those blockchains freezing anybody. But when at, they at, do, look yeah. out, David's coming for you. if they do you. do that, we are, we are talking about it. <laughs> we are talking about it in angry tones. Yes. <laughs> right, that'll be the angriest part of the podcast. This is pretty cool. Okay, on the regulatory front, PayPal is um, planning a stable coin maybe? Now this is leaked news, so PayPal didn't come out and say it, but somebody was like, 
digging into the code and found references to PayPal that it would be backed by the US dollar. But how big would that be if PayPal issued and launched their own stablecoin? I wonder what that would look like and how that would change the conversation about stablecoins in the United States. Pretty bullish from my perspective. Yeah, the thing is that, I mean, I guess the competition in isn't all that crazy. There's really only USDC and I guess also Paxos. I'm not considering Tether as part of the conversation because it's offshore. Uh, sure, I guess there could be more competition in the stablecoin space. We'll see how PayPal uses its influence to penetrate its own stablecoin into the DeFi markets. The the next few uh, things we'll talk about are all kind of related to that. So there was this, uh, this hearing uh, in, in the Senate, I believe, with Powell and some various senators who were talking about stablecoins, various things. And Powell made the comment when asked if stablecoins and a central bank digital currency could both exist simultaneously at the same time. He said, yes, a central bank digital currency and stablecoins are compatible. They can both exist together. You don't, you, you don't have to just have one or the other. So making some room for stablecoins. And then there was this, uh, Senator Tom Emmer, he just introduced a bill that actually prohibits the Fed from issuing a central bank digital currency directly to individuals. And this bill would also support privately adopted stable coins. And here was his rationale for doing so. As other countries like China, he says, develop central bank digital currencies that fundamentally omit the benefits and protections of cash, I think he means privacy, it is more important than ever to ensure the U.S. digital currency policy protects financial privacy, maintains the dollar dominance, and cultivates in, uh, innovation. Central bank digital currencies that fail to adhere to these three basic principles could enable an entity like the Federal Reserve to mobilize itself into a retail bank, start collecting personally identifiable information on users and track their transactions indefinitely. He goes on to say, requiring users to open an account at the Fed to access a U.S. CBDC would put the Fed on an insidious path akin to China's digital authoritarianism. And he says, any central bank digital currency implemented by the Fed must be open, permissionless, and private. This means that any digital dollar must be accessible to all transact on a blockchain that is transparent to all and maintain the privacy elements of cash. That is incredibly powerful. Hearing that coming from a senator with a bill to back that up. I'm not sure how much steam this bill actually has, the likelihood of passage, but I love that we're starting to have this conversation. This is the conversation we need to have. Like digital currencies could be very bad, very authoritarian, could usher in a dystopia if we're not careful. And the way to do it right is with public blockchains. Issue a, issue a stable coin on a roll-up, even a central bank digital currency on a roll-up. Have the private sector develop this out and, and collaborate uh, as well. Like This is the way to export the dollar in the digital world. Use free open source technologies blockchain to do it. The combination, there, there are plenty of good things about a central bank digital currency. There's a lot of financial inclusion that it can bring. And there's also a lot of bad things as if you just listed the, the censorship and all that stuff. The combination of a central bank digital currency on a roll up on top of a decentralized public blockchain is the, the best of both worlds where we the Fed gets to have all the control that it wants to have on the roll up but it can connect to the rest of an open, open permissionless financial system. And the Fed and the, United, the interests of the United States get to be instilled by injecting its dollars into the, the market. So uh, I'm interested. Yeah, pretty cool that this is uh, actually maybe happening, actually being embedded in a bill, and I think this is bullish. So David, I think part of the reason we're getting some of this support in Congress is because we have politicians running crypto platforms now, one of which was Erica Rose, whom we had on the Bankless podcast. She is running on a pro-Bitcoin, pro-crypto uh, platform, running against Brad Sherman, who is about the most anti-crypto member of Congress that exists. Uh, and we we talked to her. We had a great podcast episode with her earlier in the week. Uh, folks can go tune in, listen to that. Um, you know, it was really interesting after the podcast, we, we went and actually looked at donor records mm -hmm. for people. She said, because go look do at that. Brad Sherman's donor do records. Apparently it's open and transparent. I have not done this uh, before, but uh, this is Brad Sherman's donation record. What do you see in here, David? Oh God, number one, clocking in at number one, Wells Fargo and company, uh, <laughs> clocking at number two, Goldman Sachs, uh, Space <laughs> Exploration Technologies Corp. Don't, don't know what that is, uh, but we got some banks, uh, Liberty Mutual, 
uh, insurance company. Um, a lot of big banks big, here. Big, big banks, big companies. Old uh, finance, Stratfi. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, yeah. So it, you know, we don't we don't have any bank support on Bankless, <laughs> do we, Ryan? We don't like the we banks. We don't. No, you don't get donations from Wells Fargo. Unfortunately, I, I don't think they are aware that we exist. Um, quite a contrast, though, versus uh, Erica Rhodes' donor mm -hmm. list. Look at this. Ryan Who's Selkis. It, clocking in that the first donor ever for Erica Rhodes, Ryan Selkis, the crypto native, the crypto believer, the crypto politician. Nice job, bunch, Ryan. Bunch of individuals here too, which mm -hmm. is really good to see. And so you donated too, David. This is mm -hmm. important to you. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, p one part because I want uh, my money to go to Erica Rhodes, but also I want to virtue signal and signal to the rest of the crypto world that they should also be donating to Erica Rhodes. Uh, and I think this this story of Erica Rhodes versus Brad Sherman is going to be a, it's a great microcosm just of so many things that are that need to happen, in my opinion, as a millennial in America. We have Brad Sherman, who is like, Again, no offense to the boomers, but like they kind of have outsized representation and Brad Sherman doesn't spend a lot of time in his district. Uh, and uh, Erica He's Rose, owned by the institutions. He's owned point. by the institutions. And Erica Rose says that, uh, Rhodes says that his disposition is that he thinks that that seat is just his, that no one can really take it from him. He's been an incumbent for over 20 years. Uh, and so we have this incumbent boomer who uh, doesn't who hates crypto who's backed by the banks and and going up against uh, him is this millennial elementary school teacher who's in her district talking to her people and who thinks that Bitcoin and crypto innovation needs to remain in America you know crypto and, and Bitcoin they're not her number one priority but like in stark contrast to Brad Sherman who wants an outright ban on crypto all Erica has to do is be like yo like yeah let's keep Bitcoin innovation in America let's, I have a good idea let's Let's keep an open mind. Yeah. That's literally all you have to do. That's all you have to say. Want. Just keep an open mind and right. let it happen. Mm -hmm. And she's had she's had plenty of personal stories where people have been able to get out of uh, a, a she there are parts of her district that are live in poverty and are un uh, that un, are unbanked and she has stories of her constituents using bitcoin to access financial services uh, and like sometimes we forget about how much of the American population is actually unbanked. So I donated to Erica Rhodes. I th hope that you consider, I'm not telling you to, but I hope you consider also donating to Erica Rhodes, at the very least, to get this Brad Sherman just, what's the right word, loser out Incumbent. of Congress. Incumbent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do it for your bags, do it for your bags, because if, if we can get Erica Rhodes elected, it'll, it'll set off a domino effect of politicians be like, oh God, the crypto people, put all of their money behind Erica Rhodes and it worked. Like imagine the influence that that would cause if we could get this to happen. So like the, the ROI from this, from a, just a industry adoption perspective is so huge. There you go, guys. Uh, we will be right back with the takes of the week. And of course, things we're excited about in the meme of the week. So stay tuned for that. We wanna first tell you about these fantastic sponsors that made this episode possible. Slingshot is a decentralized trading platform that combines the performance and ease of a centralized exchange with the openness and transparency of DeFi. Slingshot aggregates liquidity from all of DeFi in order to find the best price on thousands of crypto assets. Every token on Slingshot comes with a price chart and trade logs to give you insights into the market's activity in real time. Slingshot is available on Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism, saving you from the high gas feeds and low transaction speeds of the Ethereum L1. There are no fees to trade on Slingshot and any positive slippage is given to the users. Trading on Slingshot is a social experience. You can even set your chat avatar to your favorite NFT or soon a Slingshot 2099 NFT avatar. Once you bridge your assets to Polygon, Arbitrum, or Optimism, go to app.slingshot.finance to trade and use the chat box to share your trades with others and find other tokens to ape into. Arbitrum is an Ethereum scaling solution that's going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Over 250 projects have already deployed on Arbitrum, and Arbitrum's DeFi and NFT ecosystems are growing rapidly. Arbitrum increases Ethereum speed by orders of magnitude for a fraction of the cost of the average gas fee. When interacting with Arbitrum, you can get the performance of a centralized exchange while tapping into Ethereum's level of decentralization and security. If you're a developer who wants low gas fees and instant transactions for your users, visit developer.offchainlabs.com to get started building your application on Arbitrum. If you're a user, keep an eye out for your favorite DeFi apps or NFT projects building on Arbitrum. Many of your favorite apps are already live, with many more coming over soon. You can find these apps at portal.arbitrum.one, and you can bridge your assets over to Arbitrum using bridge.arbitrum.io in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be. Fast, cheap, and friction-free. 
The Gemini exchange has been my exchange of choice ever since I got into crypto. I use Gemini to both buy the dips and also manage my regular automatic monthly purchases of my preferred crypto asset. On Gemini, you'll find over 50 different cryptos, including many of the top DeFi and metaverse tokens like YFI and Axie Infinity. Using Gemini Earn, you can earn yield on your various cryptos, including 8% on the GUSD stablecoin. Gemini is available in all 50 states and more than 50 countries worldwide. So if you're looking to upgrade your crypto exchange, sign up at Gemini with Gemini.com slash GoBankless and get $15 of Bitcoin after you trade $100 or more within the first 30 days. That's Gemini.com slash GoBankless. All right, we're back with the takes of the week. Let's start with this one from Vitalik Buterin. This was from the Reddit AMA with Ethereum researchers that uh, conducted last week, but uh, it was a really good take and Vitalik tweeted it out. It was his argument for why the future will be multi-chain rather than cross-chain. There's some differences there. And he says, there are fundamental limits to the security of bridges that hop across multiple zones of sovereignty. What did he mean? It's cool because we discussed some of this on our bridges panel that we just had earlier in the week. If you guys want to hear that discussion, go check this out. The great L2 migration panel where we dig into some big brain bridging projects and we get their insight on this take too. But I thought this was a super interesting take and it reminded me of our episode that we did with uh, Rune Christensen about the, um, the security hazards of relying on bridges that are multi-sig, that are centralized bridges, and how that is kind of the destination we're heading to towards if uh, we go in the direction of a massive cross-chain ecosystem, where you have one layer one communicating with a second layer one. Vitalik goes and kind of illustrates the difference here. It's really interesting. If you have, say, um, Ethereum, and you want to get that to the Solana token, and you transport that ether to Solana, it becomes kind of a, a soul ETH type token. Right. And it has a much different security profile than uh, Ethereum because, why? Because you have to use some level of a trusted bridge in order to get that ether to Solana. And the other direction is true too. If you take Solana and you move it to uh, Ethereum, you have a weaker form of Solana. Uh, and that that because there is a a security there because there is a bridge in between those things it really changes the risk profile of the asset so something could happen to that bridge and the ether that you had on solana becomes worthless or worth like 50 60 percent of the value that that it should be worth and so this becomes a problem when you get like chains of chains that are strung together and all connected by bridges right. because it creates a, a very fragile ecosystem uh, for finance. So that's why Vitalik says he actually doesn't think that world uh, is, is very likely. What he instead thinks is more likely is that we'll have very clear zones of sovereignty. So you'll have sort of an Ethereum world, you'll have a Solana world, you'll have an Avalanche world, and their assets, their version of an ERC-20 and their tokens will be kind of isolated into their universes. So um, for Ethereum and, and you know layer two, that's all one in the same universe. But as soon as the assets transfer to something like Solana, it enters into a different zone of sovereignty. So it kind of, for me, David, it sort of um, throws a, a monkey wrench in the gears of this idea of a multi-chain ecosystem. I know there was some pushback on, on this post from Vitalik, but what's your take on it? People have identified blockchains as like the new age nation states for a really long time. And this is just an articulation of that thesis where you know, Solana and its layer two ecosystem, if it ever develops one, it would be great to keep to for for that ecosystem, right? Like Solana uh, tokens get put on Solana L2s. Ethereum tokens, Ethereum NFTs get put on Ethereum layer twos. But when we talk about multi-sig bridges, the whole point of these crypto things is to have strong settlement assurances that are trustless. And as soon as you use a multi-sig bridge, which is the only way to go from one L1 to another L1, uh, you compromise on so much of what makes blockchain super, super cool. Uh, and so it, it, I think what, what Vitalik's saying is that like, you know, he's not saying that, that there's going to be one chain to rule them all. He just kind of thinks that like the Solana things are going to stick inside of the Solana ecosystem. And the Avalanche things are going to stay inside of the Avalanche ecosystem. And there's not going to be too much interconnectedness between these things. Because imagine way to if say you, that is like there, there's going to be borders. There's going to be borders. There, these are borders. Yeah. And it's going to be difficult to pass uh, through these things. And you're going to have less incentive to do so. 
Because imagine if like, just like your, the example, like imagine if you took a uh, wrapped ether, you sent it over to Avalanche to the Avalanche bridge. You sent that from, from Av so now you have wrapped ether, uh, Avalanche wrapped ether. And then you take your Avalanche wrapped ether and then you send it to Solana. And then you have Solana Avalanche wrapped ether. And you then you send it back to Ethereum. And it would be yeah. Solana Ethereum Avalanche wrapped ether. It would be, be a complete mess. Yeah. Where if you send it to a, a, a roll up, you don't, you don't stack the dependencies. You don't stack the risks. The risks stay small rather than compounding. Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I do think we'll have multiple layer ones in the future, but they'll all sort of be like nation states in that mm -hmm. they'll have borders and there'll be trade between these nations, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the, the you know the different chains, the different nations will, will be at war. They right. will interact and will they, they will have commerce. But I, I do think you will have like citizen assets and you will have foreign assets. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you project that forward, um, you know, that's, that's an interesting way to, uh, to see how crypto is going to evolve. And I, and I don't think that's very widely known or appreciated that, um, you know, the security profile of an asset can change drastically when you connect it with a multi-sig bridge. We can even talk about the concept of like tariffs, right? Because if you want to take like the Solana token and wrap it on Ethereum and then use that as collateral, these applications are going to have to t take into account that increased risk and they will be charging uh, higher fees they on should. that increased risk. So, yeah, because they're taking the it's risk. It's a riskier asset. Right. Yeah. And so like there's going to be like pseudo tariffs in order to port your assets into a non-native uh, domain. It's funny. Maybe not as borderless as um, as people yeah. hope. Yeah. Just, uh, borders. <laughs> new borders. Well, new nation states, borders. new borders. Yeah. That's right. Makes sense. Um, Let's talk about this. This was a take from someone who said, crypto people, we need to make crypto accessible and also crypto people. Ethereum, Arbitrum, Squeth, ZK Sync, Plonk, Vitalik Buterin. As if all of these terms are uh, esoteric and hard to understand. Anthony Sasana with, with the take under this take. Um, internet people, we need to make the internet more accessible. Internet people, TCP IP, HTML, CSS, JSON, API, modem. I think what he's saying here is all of these terms will become so native to us uh, that they, they won't really matter anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So like like the terms of the internet, like the word JPEG at one point in time, that was geek speak, right? right? It's like, or, or GIF. That was like, that was nerdy talk, right? Like, you're oh, you're an HTML programmer using right. GIFs and JPEGs? Like, that's nerdy, right? That's geeky. But now it's just a common, it's common parlance. It's, it's entered mainstream. And a lot of these things like TCP IP that people haven't heard of, well, mainstream users don't actually have to know what the TCP IP protocol is to use a website or use an application. Mm -hmm. and I think Anthony's saying that all of this will get wrapped into right. the internet ju just as the previous generations of the internet have been wrapped into it. That's exactly right. The, these are things are going to get abstracted away. Actually, I don't even know. I don't think I can name a single one of these things. Like, I don't know what a TCP IP is. I know IP is Internet Protocol. HTML, I don't know what that is. CSS, I don't know what that is. JSON, I don't, you don't know, know what, what these things are. Yeah. I don't know what they are. I mean, I know okay, I know what yeah. they are, but I don't know yeah. how, what they stand for. Uh, and so, like, the point of technology is to abstract away the protocols and make these things super accessible. And so, it, the fact that the protocols exist are what makes them accessible is now it's up to the interface layer or the browser layer to obfuscate these things. Also, uh, and, also kind of weird that this uh, this Vital Twitter user listed Vitalik, Vitalik Buterin. Buterin. Well, that's an esoteric name. Vitalik like, Buterin is not necessarily the most accessible person out there, so I take the <laughs> point. <laughs> He is just Vitalik, though. You don't have to use his last name. You know, he's kind of sure. like a Madonna or Prince. It's, you know, it's just sure. Vitalik. Um, let's go here. Kobe had a fantastic clip. Should we play this? Uh, yeah, let's play it. Before I had money, I thought everything was a scam and uh, it was all rigged and blah, 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 blah. And now having money and being able to help my family out, for example, and seeing um, my parents personalities change because they don't have to worry about certain things anymore like making ends meet or like what's gonna happen when they retire seeing their personalities change and getting to know them more as people because some number changed on a screen makes me a like everything seems like a giant scam but b feel like i was also slightly robbed of experiencing that while I was growing up or while I was younger because they had these burdens and had to worry about them. So it doesn't weigh on me so much, but I do think a lot about about that. Like it feels like everything is a bit of a scam for some like weird numbers on a screen. And it means that people like live their lives in ways where they don't get to properly know the people around them because everyone's always worried about short-term stuff. 
So David, this clip was from our recent episode with Kobe and absolutely blew up on Twitter. Why do you think it resonated and landed so much with people? Well, everyone kind of resonates with the story at, at one point or another. It's not like most people struggle with money. Um, that's something that usually everyone comes across. And so uh, everyone kind of ideates about what their life could be like if money wasn't an issue. And I think that was the biggest issue, uh, the biggest takeaway that I had out of this is that like a lot when uh, Ryan and I, you really, you and I really emphasize decentralization and, you know, some people just aren't in a place that they can worry about decentralization. They need to worry about other things like getting out of the rat race, getting out of the nine to five, actually having stability in, in financial terms then they can start to worry about decentralization. So that's kind of my takeaway. Yeah, I really like this conversation with Kobe because like, I think he um, he articulated things differently than Bankless and, and pushed back on on some different things that I think we we emphasize from time to time. Like with some reflection, uh, yeah, I, I sort of thought about this. This is uh, my tweet. Um, people don't come to crypto for decentralization. They come to get rich so they can live fuller, uh, freer lives. And they don't like anyone gatekeeping about how they got rich. Pontificating decentralization is a thing people do after they get rich. That's why it can feel out of touch. I think you and I on Bankless a lot, like we talk about decentralization so much that um, that can become in some people's minds sort of like the the end game. Like why are David and Ryan always preaching about decentralization? And I think we have to remember collectively, all of us in cryptos, like Bankless and you know listeners externally, is decentralization is just a means to an end. It is anti-corruption technology, but the end goal is freedom. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you don't have, if if you still live in sort of the scarcity mindset of living paycheck to paycheck, right? And you know, uh, money is a real issue for you. Well, like you don't have freedom either. So at some level, thinking about systemic problems like decentralization. Like that's something that you do after you have money. So mm-hmm. I think sometimes that is why when, and this is for, for people who value decentralization like us and, and talk about it so often, that's why it can come across as sounding preachy or out of touch. Because like, hey, like people are in crypto and I, I think part of the attraction that brought you and I in crypto, of course, is like the ability to make money fast, mm-hmm. right? towards some financial freedom in the future. What what are you going to do with that freedom? Like live a fuller life, provide for those around you. That's what Kobe's clip was about too. And I think we have to remember that uh, as we're talking about and extolling the virtues of decentralization, that it is a means to an end. Freedom is the end. And um, there's like, you almost have to get, you have to do well for yourself first to to fully appreciate that. And that gives you the the, the time to think about these these higher level things like decentralization. Um, so some people aren't ready to talk about decentralization yet. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think sometimes we run the risk of like, if we overemphasize it, we, um, we might sound a little bit preachy or mm-hmm. out of touch. And um, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are. It's a, it's a hard thing to talk about sometimes. Yeah, yeah, um, it's, it's definitely um, a privilege to be able to care about decentralization. Like it's, it's, it's what I hope people, all people after they get theirs, lean into after they get theirs, right? right. Uh, it, it's something that we all should strive for, but I, I now fully accept that anyone needs to do whatever they need to do to get out of the rat race and, and to get theirs. And, and so I think the mistake that perhaps we've, we've made is that Ryan and you and I have made our wealth using decentralized assets, Bitcoin and Ether. And if you go and everyone who comes into crypto uh, is kind of a product of the generation that they came came in at, right? Like you came in, I think, in 2016, I came in 2017. And the only two assets that made it through the 2018 to 2020 bear market, actually, there's three of them. Uh, Bitcoin, is, and which is decentralized. Ether, which is decentralized. And what, what, what's number three, Ryan? That, that Doge. It, Dogecoin, <laughs> which Doge is also through, yeah. decentralized. Yep. Uh, and so like, that's a lesson that we've learned. And we've saw, we saw the centralized spinoffs come and go. Things like EOS uh, and like things like all the, I can't remember all the other centralized spinoffs that came out in 2017. And so we saw centralization fail. Uh, and we didn't want to see history repeat itself. But it didn't. Um, cent- some some acceptable amount of centralization has worked out, and it's made a lot of people very very uh, wealthy. Uh, and what I think the mistake we made was like it's like, hey, we we made our our wealth using decentralized assets. You need to make your wealth with decentralized assets too. And so we kind of gate kept how people choose to to choose to you know get out of the rat race. And I think that that was a mistake that I am now reflecting upon. 
I However, think- I, 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 I want to also extrapolate into the future. The reason why decentralization uh, works so well and why we emphasize it is because decentralization means that there's room in the future for future generations to also make their wealth. Because in my mind, centralization tilts into the favor of a few people rather than the many, whereas decentralization is much more balanced and much more long-term focused. And so I think the world will have more total wealth for more total generations and be able to include more people in the long term if we ultimately land on decentralized platforms. So we have to have to consider the near term of needing to get wealth now so people can actually start to care about these things while also ensuring that we are decentralized enough to include future generations so that they can also get theirs. Yeah, I think I think part of the, part of the bankless platform from from day one has been like kind of no shortcuts, right? Mm-hmm. And that that's that's been important. It's like I I I do think that um, some of the centralized L1s will not stand the test of time. And I'm not sure There's which a lot. ones There's too many those are. Yeah. Like, and we've seen many cycles where you know th- that has happened. They've just kind of you know collapsed, and you know, f- founders have gone on to other projects. They've never really developed a, a community. And I worry that that is also happening this cycle too, yeah. which is why it's like it's kind of like part of the call for Bankless is like, hey, think about the long term, right? It's like what what has fundamentals, what is sustainable. Uh, you know, decentralization is is one of those things that is sustainable in the long run. Run and is a competitive moat, competitive advantage, but it's not the only way to do well in the crypto markets, right? And I think um, one of the things that that we need to take with us in 2022 is just like being happy when people do well and achieve yes. financial freedom in crypto. And I think we've always been that. And at times when we've been harsh, it's been like I think more directed at I feel like people who should know better, right? It's like yeah. Justin Tron should, your Justin Sun rather, should know better yeah. in, in like copy pasting Ethereum, hyping it up, making a big deal, you know, like issuing Tron and then like exiting the project. And then just a couple And then few collecting years later. more Ether than Vitalik Buterin. Yeah. It's just like, it's just, it sucks. Okay. And it's like, so people have been in the space for a while. They've seen these cycles repeat and they're just like, they see it every time. And that's why they come off uh, a little, like you and I sometimes come off a little, little strong and a little harsh on other projects. But uh, anyway, that's uh, that was a good learning lesson from Kobe and I think uh, w- one of our takeaways. So we'll carry that forward. Um, David, what are you excited about this week, man? Oh man, right after this, Ryan, I'm taking all the stuff that you can't really see in the background because I'm hiding it, putting it in my car and going off to Joshua Tree because I just got done ice climbing, but I haven't finished getting my climbing fix. So I'm on my way to Joshua Tree to okay. go climbing. So here are the ice climbing pictures. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. By, by the way, like, yes, there's a harness with that rope definitely holding on to me, but like, I am also holding on as I take that selfie. That is not <laughs> just a relaxed arm uh, holding onto an ice axe. Like how, um, how secure is that ice axe? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, hold, it's holding my entire weight. Be- between holding- that ice axe, uh, ice axe and my feet in the wall, yeah, that's my entire weight. Wow, and you're yeah. totally roped in, like yeah. you know, oh, super nothing duper. could possibly oh, yeah. go in yeah. wrong. Right, yeah. I mean, I did fall off the wall and got caught by the rope a number of times, yeah. <laughs> but okay, this, well, so yeah. it's, it's been tested then. <laughs> yes, certainly. Yeah, uh, that's, I thought you had hardcore. a pretty funny funny comment in this, which I, I think is linked. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, said this. Yeah. When someone says bankless is too risk adverse, I'm tweeting them this photo, <laughs> these photos. Uh, yeah, absolutely, man. Mm. You, you're doing it. Something I could never do. Ice climbing Definitely scope, yeah. On the um, edge. Hopefully, I'll, maybe I'll come back with some pretty dope rock climbing ch- uh, pictures as well. Sweet. Ryan, what are you excited about? Uh, I'm excited about competition coming for, for OpenSea. I think this is a big deal. I think um, these kind of community-led vampire attacks really level the the playing field. I mean, we are talking earlier in the episode about um, VC things getting attacked by community things. I think that's a trend that's, that's going to continue. Um, and I think ultimately users win from that, right? So like we get new platforms, we get new experiments, we get to um, put the incumbents on their heels to you know think about who they're rewarding in their ecosystems and it's all net positive. So I'm super excited about that. I'm also excited about the recent unblocking that is happening in crypto Twitter. So right, like in crypto Twitter, there's always backs and for- back and forths, um, like people make enemies, you know, block people, uh, some people block you. Uh, one person that's blocked me, and I had no idea why, is uh, Sam Bankman-Fried from FTF, uh, SBF. And he, um, I don't know, maybe it was something I said at some point in time. We've never really had an interaction on Twitter. But um, with Kobe's 
with, with this with this video that kind of went viral, um, you pop actually tweeted this out. Yeah, who doesn't talk about Bankless? It. By the doesn't way, doesn't tend to talk about Bankless, right? But by the way, I had some nice things to say about Anthony Pompliano because I do respect what he does in the space and yeah. his hustle uh, and his ability to to build fantastic uh, media products, media companies. Uh, and you know, so he tweeted something out from Bankless, which never happens about Kobe. Uh, and then a Bitcoin maximalist who we've had on the podcast, uh, Preston Peach said, wow, I really like this point. Kobe says, oh my God, I got unblocked. I guess Preston Pish uh-huh. had blocked Kobe in the past. So he got unblocked. And I said, we're healing the world out here, Kobe. Next, someone get SBF to unblock me. And then SBF shows up on the thread and he's like, I just unblocked Ryan. So everyone's unblocking everybody. I think you called this, David, uh, uh, unblocking Jubilee or something like this. Mm-hmm. Like we're all resetting the clock here. Yep. Yeah, and I really loved your tweet follow, following uh, SBF saying, hey, I'll, I'll give you a shot, we'll, I'll unblock you, and you go, suddenly, S, best be friends for <laughs> yeah. SBF, which I, I thought was, was pretty funny. So yeah, I, I'm, everyone's loving everyone right now. And so uh, I good. think maybe the, the end of uh, Q4 2021, the rise of the alt ones kind of caused some, some spite, but um, I think they're now oh, love only, love only on, on, on crypto Twitter. There you go. That's what's happening. Uh, meme of the week, David. You ready for it? I'm ready for it. Yeah. All right. What are we looking at? This is the uh, my parents in their 30s versus me in my 30s meme. Uh, and so my parents in their 30s, honey, we've saved enough for a, a house. Why don't we also have kids? And then me in my 30s, which is this guy with frazzled hair, looks like death, <laughs> just like gaunt eyes, and goes, I just took a nap and I'm down 22%. Uh, <laughs> and that was the story of the last week or so. Uh, that is crypto all the time. That's how it feels, guys. But uh, we're, we're glad you're with us. Of course, as always, none of this has been financial advice. Bitcoin and ETH are risky. So is DeFi. So are all of the alt layer ones. You could definitely lose what you put in. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone. But we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.